Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of David and Melinda Harmon? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. David Harmon was born on January 3, 1957, and grew up in a suburb of Rochester, New York. His father, John, and his mother, Sue, were both members of the Church of the Nazarene. When David was 15 years old, he met a girl named Melinda Lambert at a Nazarene summer camp outside of Ithaca, New York. Melinda had been raised in Syracuse. Her father was a high-ranking Nazarene church official. David and Melinda married in 1977 when they were both 20 years old. The couple moved to Olathe, Kansas the same year. Melinda's father had been transferred there to another leadership position in the Nazarene church. He owned a duplex in Olathe where the couple lived. David worked at a bank earning $13,000 a year. He was an entry-level loan officer. Melinda took a job as a secretary at Mid-American Nazarene University. Neither one appeared to be motivated about advancing their careers. For example, David was highly interested in playing practical jokes. While at the university, Melinda befriended the student body president, Mark Mangelsdorf. She introduced Mark to David, which led to Mark and David becoming friends. Mark would often hang around at the Harmon's residence. Over time, David gained quite a bit of weight, and Melinda started spending a lot of time with Mark. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. During the early morning hours of February 28, 1982, a woman in the duplex adjacent to the Harmons heard heavy thudding noises coming from the other side of the wall. She described the sound as the repeated smacking of meat. She put her ear against the wall, but the noise stopped. She told her husband about what she heard. Her husband told her not to worry, saying that at worst it was David Harmon falling down the stairs. This seems like a bizarre comment. When somebody uses the term at worst, it's typically followed by something that's not too bad, like something that could be tolerated. Most people would consider falling downstairs pretty serious, mostly because of the being maimed or dying parts. At about 3.30 a.m., which was just after the neighbor heard the noise, Melinda ran over to the neighbor's duplex and told her that David had been attacked. When the police arrived, they found David's body in the upstairs bedroom. He had been bludgeoned to death. It was one of the bloodiest crime scenes they had ever seen. David had been struck at least 12 times. The police believed that the assailant used more force than was necessary, like an overkill situation. Melinda told the police that she had been awakened by her husband being attacked by two black men wearing masks. The assailants pulled her downstairs into the living room. She could hear one attacker say to the other, I think you hit him too hard. You may have killed him. The men demanded the keys to the bank where David was employed. Melinda was knocked unconscious after giving the men the keys. She woke up an hour later, and this is when she ran to her neighbor's residence. Police officers were sent to the bank to wait for the mysterious men to show up, but they never did, probably because they suffered from a non-existence problem. Here's what the police found during their investigation of David Harmon's murder. There was no forced entry into the duplex, and nothing was stolen. No murder weapon was found at the scene. No fingerprints, no footprints, no hair, nothing that could help solve the case. A lot of blood was found on Melinda's pillowcase, but only a little blood was on the bottom of her nightgown. This didn't make sense considering how Melinda was supposed to be beside David in bed with her head on the pillow when he was attacked. Melinda had a tiny bruise on her cheek, but she said that she was knocked out for over an hour. One would think that the force required to knock her unconscious for over an hour would create a more significant injury. Not long after the neighbor called the police, Melinda asked her to call Mark. He arrived at the duplex a few minutes later. It was clear 
that he had just taken a shower, but when confronted by the police, he denied this. Melinda and Mark told the police that the day before the murder, they had taken a walk and spent time at the duplex. Later, they admitted that they stopped by Mark's apartment as well. When they had spent the time at the duplex, no funny business had occurred. They claimed that they had taken separate naps. In Mark's apartment, investigators found cards and letters that had been exchanged with Melinda, which indicated affection between the two of them. Both of them denied being in a romantic relationship. They claimed they were just friends. They had never even kissed, much less engaged in any sexual activity. Mark's fingerprints were found on the back patio door of the duplex, but there was no way to know when those fingerprints were left. A police dog tracked Mark's scent from the duplex to a trash can behind his apartment, but nothing was found in the trash can or at the disposal site where the trash had been taken. If the intruders had obtained keys to the bank, it would not have done them any good. The vault was protected by a time lock. The police thought that Melinda and Mark may have conspired to murder David, but they did not have enough evidence to make an arrest. Everyone continued with their lives. Melinda moved back to her family home in Ohio. She married a dentist named Mark Rosh in 1986 and changed her last name. They went on to have two children. Mark Mangelsdorf earned an MBA, became a corporate executive, and eventually became a multimillionaire. He married and had three children, but divorced in 1997. In 1999, Mark married again. He lived just outside of New York City and had two more children. Mark eventually lived in a $1.3 million home. In 2001, the police reopened the case of David Harmon. They were able to move the case forward a little bit. There was blood found on the carpet just inside the door of Mark's apartment. DNA testing revealed that there was a 98% chance it belonged to David. There was no way to know when the blood was left there. Human blood was found in Mark's vacuum cleaner, and his neighbor said that Mark ran the vacuum on the night of the murder, but the blood could not be identified. This was not enough evidence to break open the case, so investigators decided that they would try to re-interview Melinda and Mark. They knew that Mark was a high-profile corporate executive and figured that he would not fall for their attempts to manipulate him. They decided to target Melinda, believing that she was more emotional and less logical. They confronted Melinda at her home in Ohio, which took her by surprise. She made the inexplicable error of speaking to the police. It did not take Melinda long to change her story about what happened on the night that David Harmon was murdered. In her original story, she claimed that two black men had attacked David, but now she was saying that the duplex was invaded by one white man. In a later interview with the police, she admitted that she maintained inappropriate feelings for Mark, feelings that her husband David would not have been pleased with. Melinda was under the impression that Mark loved her and wanted her to get divorced. At this point, Melinda revealed something even more surprising. She stated that she knew in her heart Mark was the killer. She didn't see him in the duplex, but she sensed his presence coming from the stairs. Melinda stopped sharing information and implied that she knew more. The police believed that she was searching for a deal. Instead of offering her a deal, they continued investigating. The case against Melinda and Mark did not get much better, but the state decided to prosecute anyway. In December 2003, Melinda was arrested. Mark was named as an unindicted conspirator at first, but then he was arrested in April 2005. Melinda went to trial a week after Mark's arrest. Mark testified at her trial. He denied having any type of romantic relationship with her and denied committing the murder. In May 2005, Melinda was convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. After her conviction, she was allowed to plead guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for testifying against Mark. Essentially, she was able to downgrade her conviction. Melinda told investigators that Mark purchased a crowbar a week before the murder and murdered David in order to be with her romantically. Melinda said that she was very, very, very sorry about the murder. 
Now, if she had said that she was very, 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 very sorry, I may have believed her. But using very just three times, well, that's unconvincing. Regardless of how sorry Melinda was, or was not, her deal with the state left Mark in a tough position. He had a decision to make which was not going to be easy. The state really didn't have much against him, and Melinda had changed her story several times, so her credibility was very weak. But at the same time, Melinda being convicted was not good news for Mark. He was risking life in prison by going to trial. The state offered Mark a plea deal, and he accepted. In February 2006, Mark pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. A few months later, both he and Melinda were sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. They were eligible for parole after five and a half years. In April 2015, Melinda was released from prison. Mark was released almost a year later. Considering the gravity of their crime and how disorganized and obvious they were as criminals, it's amazing that they escaped harsh punishment. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. David was highly committed to the Church of the Nazarene when he was young. He was a Bible quiz champion and would carry around a book about earning souls. Evidently, this made him a popular person in the church. Not long before his death, David became obsessed with eating and gained a tremendous amount of weight. Item number two, Melinda was described as loquacious and a poor student in school. She viewed her main career objective as finding a suitable husband. She believed that God would make a way for her. Even in prison, Melinda believed that God was going to open the door for her. Melinda attempted to follow the strict rules of the Nazarene church, at least for a while. When she was at the summer camp where she met David, Melinda would report other teenagers who were found in compromising situations, like kissing or holding hands. On one occasion, she told on teenagers who used sticks to drive away a skunk. I'm not sure why that would be considered an offense. Was there a banner hanging at the summer camp which had rules like no kissing, no holding hands, no lying, and be nice to skunks? I guess they were tired of all the anti-skunk sentiment. It just didn't smell right to them. When Melinda worked at the university, she continued her pattern of exposing secrets. She reported the dean for allegedly having an affair. This caused him to be fired. It stands to reason that Melinda was drawing on the same principle of gaining religious standing through exposing the sins of others when she implied that Mark was responsible for her husband's murder. Melinda apparently did not understand how a conspiracy can make that tactic less desirable, like her and Mark were in on the murder together. Implicating him made her look bad as well. Item number three. Mark grew up in a conservative religious environment and was eventually influenced by the Church of the Nazarene. His goal was to achieve perfection. Later in life, it appears as though Mark became less concerned with morals. He also became more calculating. I think that's why he accepted the plea deal. Mark made a business decision, devoid of emotion, unlike the calculation that landed him in a bad spot in the first place. This brings me to item number four. There appeared to be a lot of sexual tension between Melinda and Mark. This is a theme which is prominently featured in this case. What could have happened as far as this sexual tension in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Melinda and Mark exchanged several cards and letters, repeatedly telling each other how much their friendship meant and sharing many deep feelings. It seems clear that they were dancing around the obvious attraction between them. One could argue that Melinda was sending mixed messages based on the content of her letters. She would keep talking about her strong feelings for Mark and how she would miss him if he was gone, but then mention how she was committed to her religious beliefs. In one letter that Melinda wrote to Mark, she said, quote, I want so much to be a help to you and never a spiritual hindrance, unquote. Mark would have known that Melinda would never get divorced. It's almost like Melinda was toying with Mark, manipulating him into solving the problem. This makes me wonder if Melinda ever actually explicitly conspired with Mark, 
Maybe she just permitted him to come up with the plan and stood by as he executed it. She was not permitted to think such things due to her purity, but if Mark was going to follow through with murder, she wasn't going to stand in his way. It seems as though Melinda did not want to hinder Mark's ability to send David's soul to heaven. David's interest might have been in earning souls, but Mark's interest was in returning souls. Mark may have felt torn about this initially, considering that he and David shared many passions, like for racquetball, floor hockey, and church. The problem is, there was one more passion they shared, David's wife. One could even argue that the murder itself contained sexual overtones. Mark used a crowbar to beat David to death as David was in bed and presumably Melinda was nearby. Almost as if Mark was saying, I'm breaking apart this union. There will be no more sex occurring here. Even the neighbor's description of the sound of the murder as a repeated smacking of meat carries a sexual connotation. Perhaps the sexual tension in Mark built up so intensely that it exploded in the form of violence. It's also possible that the separate naps claimed by Melinda and Mark were actually sexual encounters. Maybe the tension had already been relieved. Now moving to my final thoughts. It appears as though Melinda and Mark never pursued a romantic relationship after the murder. Perhaps they realized that it would look suspicious or they didn't want to be with another killer. I think this illustrates the fleeting nature of passion. The attraction between them was so strong that it facilitated murder, but it dissipated so quickly that they moved on without each other. Another lesson in this case would be that divorce is a lot more desirable than murder. Both Melinda and Mark allowed their options to be artificially restricted by their strict value systems, never appreciating how murder was also a violation of their beliefs. Arguably, for this couple, it was never about breaking the rules. It was about not appearing as though they broke the rules. Based on the outcome of this case, it looks like they failed to achieve that goal. Those are my thoughts in the case of David and Melinda Harmon. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.